This microserver supports ECC memory. It has ILO for out of band management, and you can put up to two PCIe cards so you can customize the heck out of this thing. Oh, and by the way, on the front, you have hard drives that you can actually shoot out of the system. We have so much to get into today, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is the HPE ProLiant Micro Server Gen 11, which is an update to the Gen 10 Plus, which is an update to the Gen 10 that you're gonna see on the STH YouTube channel. We've done these, and people love these systems, and I understand why. These are cool little systems from HPE, and HPE does something different than a lot of its large OEM competitors. It makes these super compact little servers. These are micro servers that are designed for SMB customers, for edge customers, and even if you have a big enterprise, they're designed to go and have an ILO managed server that you can put all the way at a branch location, an edge location, and you don't have to go and use some other kind of system. You can still manage everything with your ILO. And in previous generations, we've shown how we can customize these servers and make all kinds of cool things like clusters and what have you. And in this generation, HPE has a couple of new tricks up its sleeve, which is just really cool. Now, I do want to say, first off, thank you to all the STH YouTube members who support us and allow us to have budget to go and buy systems like this so we can do our independent reviews. If you do want to help us out, you can go and find the join button down below. But I have to say, as much as I love this system, there is one feature in here that I'm so bummed about, but I will say that there is a ton of really cool innovation, so let's get to the hardware. Okay, now the first thing I wanna talk about with this is of course the size of this unit, because these tend to need to be fairly small, so that way they can fit into small, medium businesses, and that's really one of the big attractions of the microserver segment. So right here, I have uh, obviously full of hard drives, because it's actually pretty heavy. This is the Gen 10 Plus microserver. And something that you're just gonna see really quickly is that it is quite a bit smaller and in two different dimensions. First dimension, of course, is just the height. You can see that that's definitely, uh, you know, this one is definitely much shorter than this one is. But the other thing is that you see that the new microserver also is quite a bit wider. Now, in some ways, you would also say that this is fairly similar to the Gen 10 Plus. But on the other hand, I think when you start to see inside the system, you'll see that there are some changes that do warrant that extra space being used. Now, looking at the front of the system, you'll see that we get our normal, nice little bezel. These things always look kind of cool. You also get two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A ports. Now in the corner over here, you also get some status LEDs. And before we open up this bezel, I thought let's go and look at the back of the system just to kind of see all the really cool things here. Now on the back of the system, you'll see that we get four USB type A ports. Now these are USB 3.2 Gen 1, so they're only five gigabit per second ports. Now in terms of networking, we get something really neat. We get four one gigabit network ports. Now it feels like for a you know, 2024, 2025 era system, it feels like it should have faster networking, but I'd love to hear what you guys think down below. So let me know in the comments. Now, other things that you'll see is that we actually do get another network port on this, and that's right here. Now, this is our ILO port for our out-of-band management. Then we also get a serial COM port, and then we get two display outputs, a VGA port, as well as a display port. Now, one of the challenges due to the Intel Xeon that this system is using is that you don't really get the high end, like you're, you don't wanna go and you're not gonna be displaying like multiple 4K displays off of this as is. So this is really kind of more meant for management rather than for like running digital signage in a small medium business. Now, in terms of power, we are using this 180 watt power brick. And how this works is that you plug it in right here, as you see, and then you have this little retention bracket. Now this little retention clip is kind of neat because it helps make sure that the DC power input doesn't end up coming undone and like, you know, go away and stuff like that. And as we get to the expansion slots, I just want to show the Gen 10 Plus against the Gen 11 real quick because something you'll notice is that the overall like configuration of ports is very similar but they're in completely different places. But maybe the biggest and most consequential change that you're gonna see is how these expansion cards work. So on the Gen 10 Plus, this was an internal low profile slot. It was kind of a pain to get to, frankly, because uh, you had to open up the system and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't like a toolless design or anything like that. But you'll see on the new version, we have this little thumb screw here that removes our latch. And now we can go once we're inside and we can go pull these out in a toolless fashion. So not only on this new version do we have two external facing slots instead of one, but we also have this little toolless design that I like. Okay, so let's talk real quick about getting inside the system. What you're gonna see here is that you can undo these two here, and then you can take off this back cover. 
And the reason that you want to take off this back cover is because you want to get access to these two latches that are on the side over here. You need to move them from the lock to the unlocked position like we have them here. And then once you do that, you can hopefully pull off the bezel as you'll see here. And something just kind of fun on this bezel is that you do have a little bit of foam here. So they were thinking a little bit, at least about dust and stuff when they were designing this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the front now that we have the bezel off. Now, one of the first things that you're gonna see is that we do have a drive that's installed here. And we're just gonna go pull this thing out for a sec. This is what you get with the system. It's a HPE drive and it depends on, of course, you know, what configuration you get. But our bare bones, we got a little drive. And this is now a four terabyte drive because I don't know if they make smaller uh, three and a half inch drives these days or lower capacity drives. But one of the interesting things that HPE always does is they have these right here. Now these on the side, you essentially take a hard drive and you screw them in. And when you screw them in, you can then take the drive and insert it. Let's go insert it down here. And they fit and they lock into place. So then it makes it easy to go and pull it out you pull it out, and again, if you need to service a drive, you just take out the four screws, and you're ready to go. I would wanna see this more as a just totally toolless solution. Like, putting the pegs in is fine, but having it be a totally toolless solution would have been a nice little upgrade here. But I do like this little mechanism, and it's cool that they're keeping it. One other cool thing that you'll see is that down here, they're actually keeping all of the little pegs. So this is a place to go and put, like if you only have one drive, you want to make sure that you have your sets of four, your three sets of four for the other three drives that could go in here. And you actually have your little peg storage here so that way you don't lose them. So getting inside the system, there are four screws. There's two on the front side over here and then two back here. And once you do that, something kind of fun happens. You'll see that the system just opens up in this kind of interesting little clamshell design. So something you'll see back here is that we are still using the cabled connector design instead of like a hot swap backplane. Now you'll see that we have our cables and these cables go here and they go into our SATA. So these are our ports for our SATA base right here. And so just kind of looking through some of the features, first off, we get our Intel Xeon processor. Now this can take two different types of Xeon processors. At launch, when we got this, this was a Intel Xeon E2400 series processor, but now we can take the new Intel Xeon 6300 series. Now, there are a couple changes due to that, right? The first one and the big one is that HPE is now offering higher core count CPUs up to eight cores in the 2400 generation. I think they were only like two and four core options. Now, that does bring me to a point that I just thought uh, I need to get off my chest, right? Which is the fact that this should be an AMD Epic 4004, AMD Epic 5, 4005 socket. You know, frankly, if you're buying one of the big markets for this, if you don't know this, is the Microsoft Windows server market, especially for like small, medium businesses that need that. And so something that you only get with this is you only get a course and you get a 16 core license pack. So I just wish that there was a 16 core option and AMD has it right now. And I, I just kind of wish the HPE folks use that. And the other challenge with the Intel Xeon is you also need things like a PCH. So the TDP of the CPU is one thing, but you also have a little extra power, a little extra cost due to that PCH that you don't need that with the AMD platforms. Now, another thing that you have here is you have four DIMM slots. I really like this. You can easily go put, you know, 32 gig DIMMs in there if you want to for 128 gigs, 16 gigabytes for something that's a little bit lower cost. And overall, I think this is great. We recently looked at the Lenovo ST45 V3 and that only had two channel memory. And that I think was one of the big misses in that platform because the platform supports it. However, that was an AMD Epic platform. So from a CPU perspective, I think that's way better than this, but this is more compact and just cooler. This system supports up to two channels of DDR5 memory, two DIMMs per channel, which allows us to put up to four ECC UDIM, so unbuffer DIMMs, not the R DIMMs that you put in bigger servers, but you can use ECC UDIMs in the server, which is something I know a lot of folks want to see. Now, in terms of our expansion card slots, you'll see that we have a PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slot, which is awesome. Then we also get another PCIe Gen 4 by 8 slot. In theory, if you do want to go put a higher end networking solution in there, you have plenty of PCIe bandwidth to be able to do that. At the bottom here, this is actually the power board. So we get our DC power input and that is where it goes to. We don't have a traditional like big honking power supply. One thing we do have though, is we have the optional, depending on the model, of course, ILO card, which also gives us our M.2 slot. So you'll see that we actually do have the ILO chip on the motherboard itself. But if you want that like dedicated ILO NIC so that you're not using one of the one gig ports also as like a shared port, 
But just note, based on the configuration that you get, it is an optional card, but it does come with some of the systems because ours came with it. Now, there are a couple little interesting, unique aspects also to the system that I think are worth mentioning. First off, the CPU cooler, where you have this little heat pipe design to the rear fan, I think is actually a pretty good design. It also helps you use fewer fans in this system. So instead of having a whole bunch of fans, you only have this one. And that I feel like is a pretty neat little feature and neat little design by HPE. Two other fun features though, are you see that we have an MCIO port in the middle that's not really labeled in quick specs or anything like that. And then we have what looks like an OCP connector right here. And instead of being able to put a nick, this just goes to the front of the chassis. So I'm not exactly sure why this is there, but it is kind of cool that it's there. I mean, overall though, with all the cable management already done, Done and all that kind of stuff like hey i don't love this processor i'm making no qualms about that there's some things that i think like the you know a back plane for hot swap i think would be great on this but overall i mean this is kind of a cool little system right i mean like look at this yeah like how cool is that Hey, so I do want to talk about customizing the system just a little bit since we spent so much time with that on previous generations. So a couple things that you need to just kind of keep in mind whenever you look at this, right? So number one, getting inside super easy and this whole new, you know, system of being able to just do a toolless, you know, service on thing, this, I think it's just great, right? Like this is super fast to go and swap out. I love that, right? And here we're just putting in a easy, just a little quad port, uh, 10 gig NIC. But what I want to point out is a couple things. These guys actually did something smart and they made this little cutout right here. And that allows you to go and put the SFP plus cage into this without running into too much issue. So overall, like that's like a little tiny design thing that some of the smaller PC vendors or, you know, mini server vendors just don't get. So, you know, this is like HPE, they get this kind of stuff, right? The other thing though, is that just the, how hot of cards you can actually put in the system especially if you want to have passively cooled cards. Like I would really look for cards that are more than that, like maybe five, six watt TDP maximum range. Intel has a new line of E610 adapters that we haven't gotten in the lab yet, but we have shown on the STH main site. We actually found them at HPE Discover. Those for like dual 10 gig would be perfect for a system like this. But one of the challenges is that if you do go and install a card in here, you are going to run into just cooling challenges, especially if you go try putting something that's too hot. Also, at some point, like if you wanted to put like a GPU or something that's like 70 watts, and even if that was actively cooled, you have to remember that we only have that 180 watt power brick. So you do have to really think about what you're putting in here, especially if you want it to be reasonable in terms of your uh, overall power consumption and cooling. The other just little tiny bummer about this is just the fact that these two slots are right next to each other. So one of the things you might put in here is you might have like a NIC and an HPE smart array adapter or something like that for a storage controller for RAID. Plus you might also wanna have like a network card or something like that. And that would be a reason to have a two card solution, but you do have a lot of room here and it would have just been nice if you had an extra space, but instead because we have this power supply situation here, we don't have that. The other small thing I wish this had was dual M.2. I know that's asking a lot for a system like this, but in a lot of cases, I think these days, especially if you have hard drives, you're gonna wanna have at least one SSD for boot, and then maybe another SSD for something like a cache drive or something that's a little bit faster, or you might just wanna mirror your boot drives. And in any of those cases, it would be nice to have another M.2 slot. We don't necessarily have that here. Now, of course, you're probably watching this and like, yeah, but the obvious situation, if you wanna do that, is that you just go add a riser with an M.2. Sure, that's definitely possible. But on the other hand, it would be nice if you just could just plug it in, right? It's lower cost. Now, in terms of performance, something that we've already talked a lot about is that this is an Intel Xeon E2400 series. There's also the Intel Xeon 6300 series that goes in these. And the 6300 series, you can think of as essentially like Intel renamed. So they went from the 2400 to 6300 series. Same microarchitecture. They just gave a couple hundred megahertz and renamed from the Xeon E2400 series to the Xeon 6300 series. Very not exciting change at all. The other thing is that the 2400 series only went up to four cores and eight threads. There's a four core, four thread option and also a dual core option. And then the 6300 series is really where the lineup I feel like fleshed out a bit and there are more options for CPUs. You can see we go up to the Intel Xeon 6369P, which is a 95 watt TDP processor, eight cores, 16 threads and 24 megabytes of level three cache. So instead of just kind of focusing on the performance of this particular system, because we got 
you know, basically the same performance that we would expect out of a system like this, because we've already tested these Xeons before. I, I thought it was more interesting just to kind of show you why I'm being so hard, I think, on the Epic versus Xeon decision. So just give you an idea of performance, here's what we got. But of course, I've been pretty hard about saying that this should be an AMD Epic box, and here's really the reason why. AMD has awesome 65 watt 12 core solutions, and they also are releasing a 16 core 65 watt solution, which we don't have yet, but that one I think is gonna be a huge winner in a system like this. And the reason for that is that 65 watt part again, you get lower TDP than on the Intel system, but you also get twice as many cores. Okay, but let's talk really quickly about the power consumption and noise. And if you haven't noticed this, I am recording this a little bit later. Before, when I was recording the rest of this video, I had just gotten over COVID, or at least I was not contagious with COVID anymore, but I was still very stuffed up. Sorry about that, guys. One of the cool things that you'll see on this system is that the idle power consumption is 27 to 30 watts, but it's not necessarily quiet at 27 to 30 watts. Instead, we're getting 51 to 53 dBA on our noise meter, even when the noise floor in our studio is somewhere in that like 24 dBA range. So it's certainly not something I would consider silent or actually not even close to that. Now, one other kind of interesting thing on the performance side. Now this has the Intel Xeon E 2434 processor and something that you don't necessarily see on servers, but this system does is, you know, at idle where our, uh, our package is about four watts or so, but when we go and put it under a load, you're gonna see that really quickly, everything jumps up and we actually hit something like 40, 50 watts momentarily. But then what happens is that over time, our overall package power consumption will go down to that, you know, maybe 37, 38 watt range. So it will not stay all the way up at 50 watts. And the other thing that you'll notice is that at the wall, we're now using 71, 72 watts. Now, just really quick, this is a pretty bare bones, relatively bare bones configuration, I guess. There's a lot of room because we only have one SATA hard drive in here. We could have, of course, you know, like, 430 terabyte or 428 terabyte drives or something like that in here and get a lot more storage. The other thing though, is that there's room to put more power in terms of, you know, more cards and stuff. So even though we're at 71 Watts and, uh, you know, holding pretty steady around that 51 to 53 dBA range, there is a lot of room to go up here. And actually something that just happened was we hit 50 Watts on the package power and now we're up to about 87 Watts at the wall. So we can go up a little bit, but what you'll see over time is that the system will go all the way down and it'll just kind of sit in that 37 to 40 watt range. It won't really sit all the way up at 50 watts at that package power. And what that practically means is that we're still running at, you know, around four gigahertz, but for some reason it won't go any higher. But it's kind of a strange thing actually with this system compared to a lot of other servers that we see. A lot of other servers, you know, when you have a like pack area, you have a TDP for a package, you'll actually see that package power consumption number go all the way up and just sit there. So if you were to look at like a higher end ProLiant server, it would just kind of sit at that higher end, uh, you know, package power. And this system on the other hand will actually go into a lower power state, kind of more like you would see a consumer system. So that's just a little bit different and you do probably lose a little bit of performance just because of that. Now with all these videos, I like to have key lessons learned. I mean, what did we learn from this video? We've been doing these things for years and we've customized the heck out of a whole bunch of these systems. And I think with the dual low profile slots here, the four dim slots, I think there are a lot of options to just go and configure this however the heck you want. And so. From my perspective, I really like that. And look, I know I've been really critical of this whole design of the Intel Xeon versus the AMD Epic 4004, 4005. I really wish that HPE just put the better processor in here. And let me give you one more thing that I wish that this server had. I wish that there was a version of this micro server that was all flash based. Here's the reason. There are a lot of businesses that frankly don't need a huge amount of storage, like four terabyte or eight terabyte M.2s are probably enough storage for a lot of businesses, especially if you could get, I don't know, eight of them or four of them in a system or something like that. I, I really think that that covers a broad aspect of the market. I mean, just remember, we got a hard drive with this, but it's only a four terabyte hard drive. It's not even like, you know, a 20 or 30 terabyte drive like we would see at kind of top end these days. It's a four terabyte drive and a four terabyte drive, you can just as easily have an M.2 drive and get higher reliability. So for edge use cases where it costs a lot of money to go and send people out to the edge and go and service these things, why wouldn't we wanna go and use drives that have like an order of magnitude better reliability and just use SSDs in here? I know from a cost perspective, that's not ideal, 
But on the other hand, once you have to go and roll a truck out to go and service these things and also, you know, power consumption, all that kind of stuff, by the time you get into it, I don't necessarily know if the TCO would actually be that much worse if you had an M.2 based solution versus you had, you know, something like this where you have hard drives. What I really wanted, of course, is a U.2 solution because then, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of capacity. But if I could offer a challenge, as much as I love popping out hard drives and all that kind of stuff, and this is a kind of cool little design for that, I would love to have an AMD Epic version with SSDs. And then just mark it as it's way quieter and way more reliable. But again, love to know what you guys think in the comments. And hey, by the way, if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues and customers? But also, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.